Well, Gary, we're standing in front of the 2018 Mustang, and that means this show's gonna be all about the all Mustang. All about Mustang, and they, they've really done a good job on that, so we've got some engineering insights to it, and uh, the powertrain, and the redesign of the front and rear ends, and, uh, and even more. We, even more, we're gonna get into the nuts and bolts of this car, we're gonna tell you what it's like to drive it, where you've got a couple of our journalist colleagues with their opinions on where this whole segment is going, and we're gonna get to all of that right after this. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, and by Lear a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Well, Gary, we got a great show about Mustang yeah, here. absolutely. And, yeah. and we're in a working garage, no less, shooting the show. Yeah, one of the more exciting cars uh, out there, and it's been worked on by these two guys. In fact, we got to introduce them. We've got with us right now Carl Woodman. He's the chief engineer on the Mustang, and Tom Barnes, yet another engineer on the Mustang. That's right. Great having the both of you guys on the show. Thanks for having us on. Okay, so this is an update, a refresh, a major refresh to the Mustang. Uh, Carl, why don't we start with you? What were the, the key things that you set out to really improve on the car? Yeah, so I think the first thing is always about styling, right? The, the intent was to make an at a glance difference. So we spent some time trying to figure out how to do that. Uh, what we decided to do is bring the vehicle down in the front. So we took it down about an inch and then we widened out the grills and added some features to really give it a nice wide look in the front. And when you say down, that's at the very leading edge, very right? Very leading edge, right. So it's not the whole cowl and everything nope. that went we, down. So it gave it a, a sleeker look as it came down because we took the front end down an inch and left the back at the cowl. So it gave it a sleek look and then widening out the grill by almost two inches gave it some stance. So it really gets a more aggressive look while actually improving the aerodynamics on the car. So that was, that was the biggest thing. And then what we wanted to do is really improve the powertrain to the best they could be. So we had a, a great opportunity with the five liter. We put uh, direct injection in it and uh, with the spray board technology, increased the compression ratio and got it up to 460 horsepower. Wait, now you gotta explain that to me. There's a term I haven't heard. Spray bore? Yeah. And so we took the liners out. So an aluminum block, you can put liners in to basically uh, create the durability for it. What we did in uh, the GT350 and the 5.2 liter is we went to a spray bore technology, which creates a, a very thin layer of... So you uh, spray yeah. the bore on, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Or spray the liner on, yeah, so to speak. Yeah, spray it on. Uh, so we were able to take that to mass production from just a small uh, prototype type of an it's operation. Generally racing uses yep. that sort of Yep. Technology. So we took a little weight out of the car and then we got like uh, eight tenths of a millimeter in diameter on the bore improvement. So uh, that was great. We we're uh, still a five liter, but we got a little bit more. Uh, 5.2 or something five maybe? Or? Oh, four or five. <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> so uh, uh, that, was, that was a great improvement. We spent a lot of time making sure that that torque could get to the road wheels. So we uh, had to improve both transmissions. So the manual transmission, uh, we went in there and put a twin disc clutch in it to take the torque and that actually decreases the effort you put on the vehicle to depress the clutch because you've uh, got mechanical advantage. Um, and then on the 10 speed was a, was a great opportunity. I mean, the, the 10 speed is a phenomenal uh, application with the clutches, the architecture, uh, the span. So we get a really great launch on the car now, and then we can quickly knock off the gears uh, and get uh, zero to 60 in less than four seconds and a quarter mile in about 12 seconds. So uh, it's just a phenomenal match between the transmission and the engine. Uh, and so the guys spent a lot of time making sure they get the most out of that. So the powertrain and the V8s, pretty much all new engine and transmission. And then uh, of course the acoustics was big. Uh, so we spent a lot of time redoing uh, both cold end exhausts. So we have uh, a standard, what we call passive, so just mufflers. And then we spent a lot of time on the active system. So it's, uh, it's kind of a next generation of what's in the GT350. The GT350 is a binary valve system, so open closed. And we went to a fully variable system that we can change pretty much on any throttle, any RPM, speed, load point, to really guarantee that we had that Mustang sound of the V8, and then people can choose 
just how much they want that sound to be. And so, so the driver can select it. Yep, it's driver selectable. Uh, so we've, uh, as in there, I go to Mustang shows, that's always the biggest thing I hear is, uh, can you make the car louder? <laughs> so, uh, but isn't there a silent feature that you can start it up with in silent mode? Yeah, so I live in Livonia and it's really kind of a tight neighborhood. And uh, so uh, the kids' room of my neighbors is next to my driveway. So I always do that. You can set a 24 hour clock so I can start it up in quiet mode, which is basically a little bit quieter than what a current production is. <laughs> It makes a big difference versus starting up in track mode. It's, uh, <laughs> so uh, you sneak out or sneak back home, however you view it. So, so this modification is, so it was 2015 that was the, the change. Now this is oh. the mid-cycle for that. Yep, so 2015 we did uh, the 50th anniversary of Mustang. It, it uh, did a lot of things to upgrade the structure. So it was a tremendous amount of work in the, in the 15 model year to get the body structure stiff and still have good visibility and a lot of work in the chassis to put the independent rear suspension in and, uh, and basically a double ball joint, so a really sophisticated front suspension. Uh, so that was really, from our perspective, it was great to play with that canvas, right? There was nothing we had to do with uh, suspension geometry or structure. It was really from the tire patch up, what can you do to get power to the tire patch and how can you get that tire patch to work for you the best in cornering, so again, uh, we brought in Magnaride from the uh, GT350, and that was, and we brought in a Michelin PS4 tire, which is the first OE to bring it into the U.S. And so, uh, those types of things gave us the ability to really push the car to what its true capability is uh, from the body structure and the suspension architecture. Tom, what was your involvement in the car then? Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Carl did it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely um, not. You know, no, Carl, Carl runs the whole business, yeah. and I'm, I'm trying to make sure that we've got an integrated car, that it feels like uh, you know one team built it, and that it has a, the personality that we want. And so synthesizing everything Synthesizing together. it all together. So, and, and Carl mentioned a few of those things. I mean, you know, power is it's, it's how fast the car accelerates, but it's also how it sounds. It's, it's also really what the steering wheel feels like in your hand. All that stuff blends together. So is this all seat of the pants and ears that, or, or is it more well, sophisticated that, than that? Well, it's all more f sophisticated than, <laughs> more sophisticated. <laughs> yeah. um, no, it's, Easy it's for you to say. Yeah, yeah it right. is. <laughs> um, we use all kinds of computer-aided tools and we do modeling up front, but in the end, you actually have to get in the car and then there's subtleties sometimes that you just don't get, but someone can feel it and you're just like, oh, oh. And then once you get in the thing that's right, you're just like, ah, you know, you smile. So it's a combination of both. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a lot of time spent driving it? Oh yeah, we definitely, I would say on, on Mustang, we have a team that's been working on it for a long time. We kind of know what we want Mustang to be. So we do a lot of modeling, we do a lot of planning. Um, we work with, you know, styling, that's huge. We work with all the other teams manufacturing. We were talking about you have to be able to manufacture it. But in the end, we drive the cars a lot and we, we drive them in different roads, different conditions, different ways. And we've, it's got to put a smile on your face. We, we want a Mustang to be a daily driver, but then we want to be able to just go, you know, take it out on just a super twisty road and just smile. And, and, and it's an emotional car. It's got to, you know, it, it's, it's got to have soul. So some of that stuff, that only by driving it can you can you feel that you're exporting the car now too. Yeah. What about test driving it in other countries? Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, Europe and Mexico mainly. Um, but I mean, Carl's been down to Australia, and uh, yeah. So um, we kind of go. We're, we're going all over. It is definitely though. It's an American car. A Mustang is a Mustang, but we want it to. You know, there's different roads or different conditions, and we want to make sure that we kind of capture the and piece of that. Yeah, I think Tom's being a little humble on the integration side. He's got over 12 years on Mustang as vehicle engineering manager. But I'll give you some examples. So it's the synthesis he's talking about. So like Sport on the 10-speed automatic was tuned with our transmission calibration team, our engine calibration team, and our dynamic calibration team on Groton, right? So they went to a racetrack. Went track to a racetrack. Yeah. To basically make sure that they could do it safely and basically go through all the corners and understand exactly how they could all communicate in their different ways of measuring a vehicle as it responds. So that, that integration is key. And just like when we do aerodynamics for export, we're very, very sensitive to how the car is at 150 as it transitions to Autobahn. 120. So we'll go out and take the aerodynamics team, which is usually in the wind tunnel, with our dynamics team. And they'll go out together and talk about, you get the aerodynamics guy riding with a helmet next to the dynamics guy with the helmet on. And they'll go out and, and gets that kind of cross-pollination of activities. So, 
And that's really what Tom does is he gets those teams together. Oh, over the years recently, I mean, has, has there been a, a greater emphasis on driving on tracks versus straight line um, drag racing? I think, you know, uh, in my viewpoint, it, if you're going to understand the tire patch and understand how it rolls back to kinematics and making those trade-offs and understanding the technology we're putting into, you really need to go in and out of a corner and go cross center and all these types of things because that's really what the customer is feeling and what they may interpret is in um, driving or cornering confidence, right? You agree, I mean? Yeah, well, what I would say on Mustang at least, I think traditionally, like way back when, it was it was a road you know, car once, you know, in the, in the late sixties and stuff. And then, it was you know, a family car. It, well, it was a family <laughs> car. It's been a lot of different things, but I'd say, you know, since 2005, um, we have kind of taken it a little more toward, uh, you know, twisties and turns mm -hmm. and things like that. And when we got the independent rear suspension for model year 15, that was a, a big way to move forward. But while that's all true, if you think about, you know, what Carl was talking about, the under four second V8, I mean, we have something that we call, you know, drag strip mode, which changes the way the calibration works inside the automatic transmission, and that is purely straight line, and it, you know, it's right. the quickest car. So, you know, it, we're, we're trying to fulfill a lot, of, uh, a lot of smiles. Some people like to just go fast and hear it. Some people like to ride it and twisty, and, mm -hmm. and other people just want to be comfortable and, and be able to talk to their friends, and mm -hmm. so we're trying to do it all. Hey, uh, speaking of uh, export models, we got a question here from one of our viewers, A.M. Guerrero. He wants to know, why do export left-hand and right-hand drive Mustangs have lower power figures? Oh, I'll take that one. So in essence, between SAE and Europe standards, uh, SAE is a transient, so you can basically, you test it and it hits the point, and that's the way SAE is set up. What the European regs will do is do steady state. So you have to hold each point. So as you hold the point, the exhaust gas increases the back pressure. So as you get hotter exhaust gas, it just, by the nature of the two test procedures, you always have lower numbers in a steady state because you got a higher back pressure mm. than you do with an SE transient. Okay, great. So it's the same engine, same power, just two different ways two of measuring it. Two different ways of measuring it. And he yeah. all, just, just one oh, add okay. to that though, yeah, yeah, because yeah. there are some different emissions regulations. And so in Europe right now, like the, we actually have to add some, uh, what well, we gas particulate filters, so they actually do raise the back pressure. Okay. And then on right-hand drives, there's a little different plumbing on some of the uh, exhaust manifolds, so you might have a little bit lower. I just wanted to okay. give yeah, yeah, you yeah. the technical. He also know. wants to know because uh, he's based in the Philippines, if I remember right. Okay. He, he's a great uh, viewer of ours. He wants to know when will the 2018 Mustang get exported to Asia? So we're, uh, we're working through, we finished the launch on North America and usually we'll follow export afterwards. And so what we say with shipping time, we're saying sometime in late first quarter or early second quarter, especially the Philippines. Sometimes that's, you know, six to eight weeks. From mm -hmm. the Spring, summer. Yeah. yeah. How, how are export sales going? So export sales will, um, will roughly be 15 to 20% depending on the month. Oh, that's pretty good. It is, uh, it's very good for uh, evening out because some of the countries it's winter, you know, it's summer in yeah. the export regions and by the time it gets there, so it works really good for a seasonality adjustment mm -hmm. because uh, in this particular industry, we, uh, this segment, it is seasonal in the production. Sure. So it, it helps not only with the volumes, but it helps us out to level off the production. I want to go back to the five liter engine for a minute. I guess we're going all over yeah. the place here, but I thought it was interesting you guys have a new injection system where you're doing direct and port injection. Yeah. So, so explain that to me. I, I'm struggling with why you would do that. Uh, so my simple, my simple explanation, again, maybe not as technical as Mr. Barnes. <laughs> oh, no, no, shot. Carl has an engine background, <laughs> so I, I see the all engine things to him. So. so, you know, we're always trying to push a five liter, right? So. You know, we did all, even for 2018, and we've got valve changes and flow changes, but really the game changer to move it forward was a fueling system. So yeah, we, we've got two injection systems, but by doing that, we were able to increase the compression ratio because we're controlling the fuel system. Uh, with a direct injection, we can control it, atomize it better, get better burn. And then based on that, because you can get a better burn, you can get better compression ratio. So we, you know, then that gives you power or, and so it's this, this great uh, fulfilling circle of power. So it, it really, 
that's the fuel system gives you that capability from the control of DI and then still having port fuel at low speeds to yeah port fuel at lower speeds more for emissions control yeah. and things like that and the direct injection to really get that high end where you want to have it so, so kind of each are doing a different yeah. job yeah. At, yeah. at the same time first so it starts port fuel yeah. and then they blend and then you're in DI okay. yeah so when we did the supercharger, because we just announced the supercharger at SEMA, that was also part of the big trick is using, uh, to develop that with Roush and Ford Performance was to get the supercharger to work with the two injection strategies and kind of understand how that transition in the supercharger world is. So yeah, it, it, uh, it's got a lot of capability uh, and I think we'll keep, keep working with that fuel system as we uh, now, move does it, does it does it decrease fuel efficiency or does it increase fuel efficiency? It increases a, um, well, a little bit. It boosts the compression ratio, Yeah, right? it boosts the compression, exactly. So it's, it's one of these things if you, so what we do with the engine, if you look at it, that it was a big enabler to find a new plateau for the five liter, right? So we, and we worked the five liter, I think I was talking to somebody and it's like viewing it as the gen three five liter, right? Because you go did the boss, we moved from the boss to another 15 and we're moving again. So that, the game changer to find this new plateau at 460 really was a fuel system. Um, it enabled compression ratio, and then we put spray board to get a little bit more, and then we got back to the intake manifolds and exhaust and reported them again, right? So it, it really, I don't, without that piece of it, that was the building block to do everything else on the five liter. Oh, just, just to, we also raised the RPM, max RPM, yeah. 500 RPM. So we're up to 7,500 max RPM, which gives you just a, a the usable range, it doesn't sound like much, but it is a lot. It, it, you, don't, you don't have to shift gears, you just run it up further. Oh, you're so. out driving with it, right? Yeah, no, I did, <laughs> and uh, I tell you, once you get up in those high rev ranges, boy, does it sound good. <laughs> it sounds really good. And, and all I can tell you is that I'm sure that the fuel injection suppliers love your strategy on <laughs> yes, the five right. years. <laughs> and speaking of engines, we got another uh, question here from a viewer, Downforce9. He says, any chance of seeing V6 engines return to the Mustang, especially the EcoBoost V6? He says the Camaro V6 so with one LE performance package is one of my favorites. Hmm. So I think um, in our world of moving the EcoBoost, our EcoBoost uh, 2.3 liter forward with 350 foot pounds of torque and 310 horsepower, um, it was a better match to the 10-speed transmission, right? Because in the 10-speed transmission, uh, you base, you can, because it's such a short span, you can shift between 5,500 and 3,500, and you're always on that flat torque curve. And so with a flat torque curve and an EcoBoost, it really matches well to a low span transmission. So you get this seamless performance that it's always there. So I think in the world of matching fun to drive, the EcoBoost provides such a better package than the V6 ever could come to match up against. And, mm. and so that's, you know, there's, it didn't have, it wasn't as fuel efficient, but just from pure performance, it wasn't, wasn't progressing anymore. We had kind of reached the plateau of, of the V6. So that's why it's dropped out of the lineup. But, but answering on what he, the EcoBoost V6, those are, they're, they're in trucks, they're awesome. You, you know, he, they are awesome. Right now, Mustang knows, we're keeping a V8 because that is, that is a heart and it sounds, you can feel it. Um, and then the EcoBoost on the i4 matches that really well. So uh, in the future, you know, there's always, you know, we're looking at all sorts of things, but right now we're sticking with what we have. Well, this raises an interesting point. So, you know, he mentions Camaro. I mean, as engineers, do you guys look carefully at what those guys are doing and do those guys look at what you guys are doing? I have no idea what they do. Um, I really don't. Um, so I, you know, of course we're looking, we're looking around at, at everyone and we're looking at, you know, cars in segment and cars not in segment uh, because a lot of stuff, you know, migrates from, from higher segments down and what yesterday was uh, luxury is a based, you know, basic commodity today. So mm -hmm. we're looking at everything. And so, you know, we've driven their cars and, and uh, we see what they do. We watch what they do. And uh, I'm, I'm, Probably they do the same. And, and right now, if you look at, uh, and I, I'll just say, you know, Mustang, we think, you know, it's a great car and all that stuff, but the whole segment and it is really awesome right now. There's, there's a lot of good choices and people have a lot of fun, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is what we think is the best. Uh -huh. so I think our mantra is we're going to build the best Mustang, right? And so I think our, our focus is usually inward and then to our customers. Uh, as to what we want to move forward, Customer and we'll spend first. a lot on what we can pull in from uh, the Ford Performance team, right? Mm -hmm. From the Michelin relationships, right. active exhaust, from Magnaride. So those are really the focuses. Mm -hmm. 
In fact, uh, relating to that, I, it's Stefan or Steven, I'm not sure which, but uh, he wants to know if the Mustang team learned anything from the Focus RS. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like what? Absolutely. There's actually uh, probably three big things uh, we pulled from them. So on the EcoBoost, uh, we went back and uh, so the calibration team actually does a calibration for the RS. Actually, we share the calibration team. Uh, so it was really kind of neat. They did a bunch of learning and they finished up the RS and we were in the middle of the development and said, hey, we can do all this. So we went back into the strategy and uh, went to what is called transient transient torque control. So basically the boost strategy then can be transient. So based on the back pressure that you get transient as you're driving, we can basically go and boost more or less and actually get what, what was termed over boost capability. So that's a lot of the reason why we have 350 foot pounds of torque is the, the foundation work the RS did, team did. And then a lot of, um, a lot of clutch developments. We actually have brand new clutches on both EcoBoost and on the uh, V8 manual. And the teams that do clutch development are global. So uh, the RS team was participating in evaluating our clutches. Um, um, so, it, and again, that is a real art in itself to decide how to make a clutch to be actually just the way you want it. Because you can make a million different types of clutches. Uh, and I don't know, I think I drove, what, about 100, 100 different versions uh, of it? We ran. Unreal. <laughs> Unreal. Unreal. Yeah. yeah. In my office is a whole series of curves, of pedal curves. Uh, we spend a lot of time on manuals. Uh, but uh, so for them, for the RST, it's always good to, to bounce off a European team. We sell a lot of manuals in Europe, and so they also help us develop our stuff. And then feed forward logics, another big thing is you do manual feed forward logics, might be a forward term, but it's basically how you can anticipate to bring the engine RPM up. And you might have noticed that when you're driving, it makes the parking lot maneuvers a lot easier. And just the development of that logic uh, was something we didn't develop between RS team, the global global team. So yeah, it, uh, it, we do spend quite a bit of time with the forward performance teams as bouncing ideas off each other because cool. we're playing in the same area. And, and speaking of transmissions, back to the 10 speed, Mac Murphy wants to know if the 2018 Mustang 10 speed has the same paddle shifters as the Raptor. Hmm. Mm. We have paddle shifters. <laughs> I would I, say I, I don't know. Have you driven a Raptor with the paddle I, shifters? I haven't. Our, sure. We have the same, we carried our paddle shifters over from model year 15. So if they took ours, they've got ours. <laughs> um, I, I don't know the answer, so, but I will tell you they are, they, they react really, really quickly on mm -hmm. a Mustang. And uh, you, yeah. you drop that into, you know, sport mode, you use the paddles and you are just getting instantaneous, right. instantaneous shift. So, so I think the simple answer is the hardware is the hardware Mustang hardware? I'm not sure if it's the same hardware or not. It's Ford hardware. It's Ford hardware. Right? Right? The software behind it, the algorithms behind it is, is the same because we build off the same 10 speed transmission calibrations and interactions with the vehicle. I got one last thing I want to ask you guys. Gary and I drove the, the 2.3 EcoBoost yesterday. It may be, in my opinion, the most refined application of a Turbo 4 that I have driven ever. And the only time I noticed any buzziness is when you were really up in the rev range and would back off a bit. And then I could hear a little bit. Other than that, not at all. You guys must have put a ton of effort into really refining that 2.3. Uh, yeah, we, we put a ton of effort. <laughs> An absolute ton of effort. Um, it, it, it shows, really, let me it, tell it you. Really, it, it, really, it really shows. Well, thank you. Uh, um, or it doesn't show, as no, I, yeah. maybe what I should uh, say. We really just want, we want the good sounds to come through, and we want the fun to come through. And we, those, in error state, things like that, we're trying to beat those things down. How so, much of a role is noise cancellation and pumping sound in helping to do well, that? Well, that's a, that is a high, uh, displacement engine to be uh, you know an i4 yeah, so right. uh, active noise cancellation helps tremendously there's definitely a boom that would be there if we didn't have active noise cancellation mm -hmm. so uh, it's very important it's very important are, are sounds synthesized that go into the cabin uh, yeah well there, there's two things one we're canceling out sound which is the bad sound and then on the eco boost we do synthesize sound that comes in and it enhances is what we call you know it's it's enhancing and it's the same engine orders we have and mm -hmm. it's not making up just fake noise it's it's what this engine would put out but it's enhancing it so it sounds cooler on the inside than your next door neighbors are going to hear when yeah, you're uh, starting it, 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 it up does a little bit. <laughs> yeah i think what, what we've noticed uh, also with the application uh, the 10-speed because it matches so well with span you don't have to push that engine as much anymore. You yeah. can live in that flat torque curve more than we did with the old six speed. So it gives this, um, 
this kind of effortless, effortless kind of power on, on demand because you're just going with the 10 speed between 3500 and 5500 and you're, just, you're never really right. having to over rev because you got so much gear capability uh, in the vehicle. Uh, so I think that helps a lot. And then just the refinement and attach to the chassis and the suspension tuning as, as we've refined it. Well, good. We're going to have to wrap this up, unfortunately. Okay. I mean, we could talk all day long. <laughs> yeah, that's right, but, we <laughs> uh, Yeah, I got to thank Carl Woodman, Tom Barnes, the both of you. Fascinating discussion. This is really good stuff. Congratulations on what you've done with the new yeah, Mustang. Team Mustang. It's, you guys are staying. Thanks, guys. Still Thanks on you guys. It. Yeah. Okay, we're going to be talking more about the Mustang coming back soon. But first, the shout out to our friends at Lear. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts, all delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. Okay, we're back talking about Mustang, this time with Mark Schaller, the marketing manager for the Mustang. What are you gonna do? How are you gonna market this thing? How are you gonna let the world know the 2018's out there? Well, the best part about, our, about this car is the following that it has. Um, you know, over 50 years of continuous production. Um, it's the most liked car on Facebook. Um, in fact, it has more likes than, than many actually full auto brands, right? So um, the fans out there are waiting for it. They've been asking for it. Um, it's on sale at dealerships right now. So um, the fun part of my job is I get to go out and actually talk to people about the car. Um, we show them the car, let them drive the car, but um, we try and let the car speak for itself. Um, you know, you can show some pretty pictures, but at the end of the day, once you get in, push that start button and drive away, it, it puts a smile on your face and that's what helps sell those cars. So, so you have Mustang guys and you have people who don't own Mustangs. Mm -hmm. How do you get the people who don't own Mustangs yeah. to, to come over to your side? Sure, um, a lot of it comes back to um, what the car represents, right? It gives you that sense of freedom. Um, it gives you that, uh, the personality that it lets you express yourself, right? So a lot of people when they, they own their Mustang, it's not, you know, my Mustang is the same as the neighbors. It's mine is different. You know, I happen to like the red one and it's a coupe and the other person likes the convertible. So you mix in the ability to personalize it where it is a true reflection of you. Um, and then you add in the fun to drive nature of the car. And ultimately people are looking for that two door sexy coupe that they can go take out and, um, you know, drive her down a, a twisty road or, or take a long cross country tour and be comfortable and get that sound and, and let or it- drag or, or drag race. Or drag <laughs> race or take it to the, the road course. Um, that's really the best part about Mustang is it, it means so many different things to so many different people. And I think that's what makes the car special. Mm -hmm. Mark, whenever I turn on the television, within five minutes I see an F-Series ad. <laughs> I never see Mustang ads. How are you going to let the world know from an advertising standpoint that the new one's out? Sure, um, we try and rely a lot on um, experiential. Um, so we'll show up at events where people are, um, whether it be races, whether it be Mustang events, whether it be um, just other consumer oriented events where people get a chance to experience the car. Um, we rel rely a lot on social media. Uh, we rely a lot on uh, the digital marketing that way. Um, when you're shopping online, if you happen to, to come to Ford.com and look at a Mustang and then, you know, when you're shopping on Amazon, you might see a, a Mustang ad as well. So it's all about trying to match up the person's um, interest with, with the right car. And that's what we try and do with Mustang. Do you see any demographic shifts in terms of the people who are Mustang buyers or Mustang intenders? I mean, has that been changing? It has. Um, a lot of people, you know, automatically assume that the only people buying Mustangs are, are baby boomers, right? Which is not the case. In fact, um, even starting with the 2015 launch, uh, we had the all new car. It's a fantastic new platform. Um, and we've seen the, the younger generation start to come along as well. Um, we saw a tremendous rise in both Gen X and, and millennials. We've also seen a good rise in, in multicultural as well. Um, so as we, as we transition later in the years, right, um, it's very important to bring new people into Mustang um, because they're gonna be our customers then for the next 20 years. So mm -hmm. um, it's very important. We're, we're trying to make sure that this, this car appeals not only to an older generation, but a younger generation. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at some of the, the features and options on the car, for example, um, a lot of the new technology in the vehicle the 12 inch cluster, you got the active valve exhaust. Um, so a lot of those cool features that um, it doesn't matter if you're 20 or 55, uh -huh. those kinds of things are, are what you're looking for in a car. Mm -hmm. We just talked with two of the engineers on mm -hmm. the car and really got into the nuts and bolts of it. Is, 
are people as interested in that aspect of it? I know Autoline After Hours viewers really want to know that sort of thing, but it's the 12 inch cluster and the connectivity and the rest that uh, most customers are mostly interested in, or, or is, is it higher on Mustang that they're into the nuts and bolts? I think it is higher than, than other vehicles where you want to get in a little bit behind the scenes. Um, no matter if it's cars or sports or anything like that, anytime you can get sort of a peek behind the curtain, it becomes a little bit more interesting, right? Um, you get to see what people do every day. Um, we have great jobs, honestly. Um, both Tom, myself, Carl, um, we come to work every day and, and you know, smile on our face and we get to work on Mustang all day every day. So the fact that we can share that with people, um, I think they appreciate that and, and they, they're actually looking to know more. Um, so the nuts and bolts are, are important. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned the cluster and so that was designed by a bunch of ex-video game guys? <laughs> there are some video game guys, but there's also a lot of car people, right? So um, on the Mustang team, there are people that have been on the team for years. Um, Mustangs are their own personal cars. They've got, you know, classics and they've mm -hmm. got, you know, uh, some more special models. And really what the team tries to do is take input from the customer and put it into the car. So that particular cluster, um, when we started the development, it wasn't the version you see today. Mm -hmm. That takes you know a couple of years of development and it takes a lot of um, attention to detail and how the customer is going to use the cluster. Mm -hmm. So it's it's you know when you're driving from normal mode to sport mode, you see the cluster transform before your eyes. That all comes from input for from Mustang owners, right? That come to us and say, this is what I'd really want to see in the car. Mm -hmm. um, you know, don't just give me a static cluster. Give me something with some movement. Give right. me some way to personalize it and make it you know um, my cluster versus, for example, your cluster. Sure, sure. It's amazing that uh, you lose you know, that, that sense of how much work goes into a car. And then you hear it takes a couple of years yeah. just to do the cluster. And boy, that really hits home. It, yeah. w one thing I wanted to ask about is, th this is minor, I suppose, but you can put the car in different modes. It can be a normal driving mode or sport or track or drag or snow and ice. Yep. Uh, but you have to hit that button twice. Mm -hmm. And if you go past the menu that you wanted, you can't go back up the other way. Why not? Uh, I, I think that was the, the way it was originally designed is to, to sequentially go through the modes, trying to make it easy so you don't really have to look at the cluster. You can kind of toggle through and, and keep your eyes on the road. Um, but, you know, we're always taking feedback from consumers. And, and when we go out to events, I talked about experiential marketing. And, and when we go out and talk to, talk to people, we're always taking feedback and putting it back into the, into the car. So that's something we can always look at in the future. Well, you know, you got to take what I said said with a grain of salt. I'm somebody who just jumped into the car and started driving and started hitting the buttons and all that. I imagine if I had the car for a week, I'd instinctively know how to just yeah. reach over and hit exactly what yeah, I want. I, you know, I've been driving them for a while and, and once you get in, you sort of understand, okay, I know my mode is is the second click oh, in. Yeah, so explain, what is that? You jump in mode? and click it. Oh yeah, so my mode is, is another way that you let customers personalize the vehicle. So if you happen to like your car in sport mode, but you want your exhaust and track, but your steering feeling normal, you can set that in my mode. So each time you get in the car, you don't have to reset each setting. You can just jump in. You don't even have to look over once you understand, you know, where the toggle is and how many clicks and click it up a couple of times and you're right back to where you were when you left the car. That's the be beauty of electronics, right? I mean, just setting those different parameters to the way you want it, that's really cool. Well, and it's, it's electronics and it's technology to benefit the driver and to benefit their everyday lives, right, and how they use the car. So we try not to just throw technology at the car. It needs to have a purpose. It needs to do something to make the customer's lives better, make the drive experience better, make it more fun to drive. And, and when it comes to my mode or the exhaust or the cluster, um, those all are features that, that really enhance the drive experience. Mm -hmm. Mark, you're talking about personalization. We're sitting here in the garage and there are seats behind mm -hmm. you and wheels behind you. I mean, what's the extent to which people are able to really make their car their car? Sure. Um, there's literally millions of combinations that, that you can make a, a Mustang. When we go to events, um, you know, one of the last big ones I went to um, was Mustang Week in, in Myrtle Beach. And when you walk the lot of all the customer cars out there, you won't find two that are exactly alike. And it's the same way with the 2018 Mustang. So you can start with the body style, right? So do you want a Cooper convertible? Do you want an EcoBoost or a GT? We have 11 different exterior colors. Do you have 12 different wheel options? You've got uh, two different, uh, you have a black or a, a, a ceramic cloth. You have um, five different, I think, uh, leather interior cloth. You have uh, Recaro seats, non-Recaro seats, 12 inch clusters, analog clusters. I mean, I could keep going. It's, it's one of those that, um, <laughs> By the time you trip through all of those options, um, you have a, a unique car 
and then it even extends past that to the ownership experience because once you own the car, well, you might want your cluster with orange and, and blue accents on the inside and you might want yours with red and green um, and then you might want your ambient lighting in blue. So there are so many different ways that you can set your car up even after you own it mm -hmm. and that just goes back to reinforcing that everybody's Mustang is personal to them and they want to express it their way and, and we want to make sure customers have the freedom to do that. How much does that happen? Because as you know, mostly dealers order the cars and they all want black, silver or <laughs> white and, they, and you know, a black or beige interior. How much of the customization actually takes place? Uh, quite a bit. Um, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but if you look at Mustang versus some of the other vehicles in our in our showroom, Mustang is the most custom ordered vehicle that Ford makes. No um, so it, it does does go back to reinforcing that those customers do want to make it their own. There are a lot that dealers order, um, but there are also a lot that, that they come in and say, I want to sit down and spec my car out this way, and they'll order it for them, and it'll have their name on the order. So um, they're willing to wait. They are willing that, to wait. That's always been the problem, right? Is in America, we want instant gratification. Yeah. I want to walk in the dealership and drive <laughs> home in a shiny new car. Yeah. But Mustang owners will wait. They will wait. Um, the, the other good part is the dealers have become really good at making sure they, with years of experience, they're, they know pretty much what people are looking for. So they have something usually pretty close. But if you want you know, a different color seat, or you wanted the other wheel, um, they'll, they'll be happy to put the order and, and customers will wait and you know they're made in Flat Rock Michigan so um, really shipping time throughout the country is not that not that big a deal um, so it's it's actually you can get the car built relatively quickly cool hey with that we're gonna have to wrap up this segment but Mark Shaler thanks so much for coming on talking all about Mustang market absolutely thanks for uh, for coming out and driving the cars and hope you guys had fun sure. we did for sure <laughs> absolutely okay another quick break we're gonna have a lot more to talk about but first a uh, shout out to our friends at Bridgestone Okay, we're back. We're going to be talking about all kinds of car things, especially Mustang. But joining us right now are Roman Micah, the publisher of Fast Lane Car, and Nick Miles with OurAutoExpert.com. Great having the both of you guys on the show. Great to be here. Thanks for being back. Okay, so we've been talking all kinds of Mustang stuff. Uh, Roman, why don't you start? What's your first reaction to the car? You know, I've got kind of this idea that once upon a time, there were basically three muscle cars, and they were all the same. but Dodge with the Challenger has kind of doubled down on muscle cars, so that's still a traditional muscle car. And Camaro has become kind of a world-class sports car. And I think the Mustang kind of falls somewhere in between there. So it's still got that muscle car heritage, but it's kind of going toward that sports car end of the spectrum. And I think people don't understand that. I think people still look at both Challenger, Mustang, and Camaro as all-out muscle cars. And they've really changed to kind of change the times. Nick, your first reactions to the car. Uh, well, I, I want to talk a little bit about what Roman says. I think it's also that, but it's also like a zoo because you can look at the different kinds of each car in those uh, different genres, as it were. So there's Mustang, there's everything from the EcoBoost, and you're, you're hitting so many different kinds of society right the way up to the, the high end, the, the five liter. And so not only do you have this umbrella which reaches across the brand, but it also reaches across many different forms of life, many different needs that people have. My reaction after driving the car is kind of interesting. Uh, first thing I thought was, you know, I'm a great driver. <laughs> I'm a really, I was a lot better than I thought I was in driving this car. It's kind of one of those dangerous things like all the safety systems in the car. They've made the ride so, so much better than it has been in the past. Not that it was bad because it was always been great, but now you can push the limits more further than you have been able to in the past. The, the Magna ride really makes you feel like you know what you're doing. And I'm, most of the time I'm there. See, Nick, I had the exact opposite reaction because I almost spun the car and I noticed that I was in track mode, which turns all <laughs> that stuff off. Right. And the crazy thing is 460 horsepower, which coincidentally is five more than the current Camaro SS. <laughs> you think that was yeah. a coincidence or you think that Ford was like, uh, you guys got to yeah, 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 gotta beat that number. You yes, know they exactly. had that, that as a target. So, so, you know, you were mentioning that, that, that people don't necessarily see the differences between the three. Is, is that because people buy the Dodge and they stick with it and they buy the Chevy and they stick with it and they buy the Ford and they stick with it and regardless of what any of these companies do, they're still going to have the same customers? Yeah, I think that these iconic cars have a depth of history and provenance that goes so far back that people still associate them with being either pony cars or muscle cars. And of course, the engineers aren't the same guys who designed them back when like Lee Iacocca was championing the Mustang, right? These guys are now aiming at Nuremberg ring times. And really that's where the Camaro has gone. The Camaro has 
become a world-class sports car. And it's funny to watch the Europeans because they don't like don't get it. They're like, you guys don't build. Wait, how come it's so fast? They just can't compute, <laughs> especially the Germans, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm. The other thing too, I think you'll notice with these cars is that they've sort of grown in their own direction. And, and that's supporting what you're saying, is where uh, Dodge is really talking about power. How much power, yeah, how much even. smoke can we get out of these wheels? And these cars aren't for everybody. There's only 3,300 of the Demon being made. And then Camaro, again, you're talking about a car which is like, we want to be a world platform. And just now, Mustang's starting to be available in Germany for the first time in these different countries. And so they're looking more towards a European market uh, rather than, than a world market. But there's sort of a, another extension of these cars as well is they're, they're becoming much more iconic. So the most, in 2015, the most shopped car with the Mustang was the Jeep Wrangler, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever when you think about it, but it makes every kind of sense when you understand people buy these cars for the number one reason of design. They buy them because they want to feel good. They want to open those drapes in the morning and look outside and go, man, I got a good life. And that's really where it starts. And then the other things are add on, the performance or the smoke or, or the sports car feel or the convertible top, whichever you know, matches those. Who would ever thought that you could get a Challenger in an all wheel drive? But those, every, again, every segment of the society has been catered for with these so, cars. So here's some more interesting numbers. 28% of Mustang sales worldwide, according to Ford, are of the manual, all right? In America, manuals are dying, a dying breed, but here it's 27%, so that's kind of interesting that we're kind of the same as the rest of the world. But, of course, now that V6 is gone, there's a four-cylinder turbo, and then there's the mighty uh, GT. And in Europe, it breaks down by country, so places like Australia, England, and I think Germany, the GT outsells the turbo, but in places like Italy, <laughs> The, the four-cylinder outsells the GT, which I think is interesting. And it kind of says a lot about the people who are buying it. And there's another fact that's very interesting, and it's looking to the future of this car. Now, where do we go from here? Because uh, if you look in the United States, uh, between the ages of 48 and 68, 73% of the cars are sold in that age range. That's 73%. That's almost, two th uh, th you know, almost three, quarters three quarters of cars are sold in that age range. So. Those people are uptaking manuals and those people are buying these cars probably at the top of that age range. What happens to that in the future? Do millennials know how to drive a stick? Are they going to be buying these cars? Well, but I, is, is the car even relevant? Let's, let's take the stick out of it. I mean, it would be, you know, the, the question becomes, is, is it, you know, you're saying it was cross shop with a Wrangler. Well, it's because somebody wants to own an Icon, a Mustang exactly. an Icon, yeah. or a Wrangler's an Icon. Right. That isn't necessarily what they want to drive, but, you know, it'd be nice to have one, right? To be able to say, yeah, I have one, but, you know, my dealer driver is a Prius. Right. I mean, you know, um, so, so what, you know, going forward, does this segment continue to exist, or does it become I sort of a... Uh, that's my point, though. My point like, like is... An like an orchid. I mean, it's just got to be... Uh, look at the age group. Who's buying these cars? And, we, we, uh, you know, they're trying to reinvent it. Ford are doing it. They, clearly, what Roman talked about is with Camaro, they're trying to reinvent the car as being much more than a muscle car. I think we're straying from what we knew as a muscle car in the 60s to these new cars. I would say these cars are more relevant than ever because, um, obviously, the sedan market is, in America at least, pretty much a dying dinosaur and cars like the Wrangler and the Mustang Camaro Challenger these cars represent um, what people look for right I think Millennials are looking for experience more than something that they own and these cars offer both right they offer the experience of driving something that that is kind of bigger than life and they offer uh, the kind of the lifestyle the the active lifestyle that some people want in a Wrangler or perhaps you know more of the muscle car lifestyle that they want in a Mustang so I think these cars are actually the most relevant cars that are out there today the rest of them are kind of toasters with wheels, you know, mm -hmm. these cars have personality. And, and Tim Kaniskas, uh, who is the president of FCA Passenger Cars, said something to me recently, which, which was, he believes in the future that there will be throwaway cars, and these are the cars that you buy for thirteen, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, and they're done in five to 10 years, and then there's gonna be the iconic cars. And there's gonna be this separation where there's gonna be very little in between. And I think this is obviously gonna be in that top end of iconic cars. And I think you're gonna to start to see that. Whereas, as Roman's right, millennials are gonna to gravitate towards an experiential car. See, I think you guys are onto something here because, you know, even though you said, uh, it's an older demographic that buys three quarters of these cars. Flip that the other way around, and what you're saying is millennials are buying about a quarter of them. 
And well, you know, well, there's the other uh, above 68 year olds too, oh, which oh, are, <laughs> which are a, there are a few, and they're a huge part of the market, especially for luxury cars. Yeah. But what you're still seeing is a lot more millennials coming into cars like this. And you know, we keep hearing about oh, millennials don't buy anything because they don't have jobs or huge amount of debt, or they don't even care because they don't have driver's licenses. That's starting to change with cars like this, and that's what I, I was wondering what you guys think as we move into this world of full autonomy. Sounds to me from what you guys are all saying, cars like this are not going to go away. Yeah, and not only cars like this, but also if you're a millennial, you're probably gonna look also at the older ones. So th th I think you see that, you, you kind of, you let's, let's flip it around again, right? If you see a strength in the market for the older versions of these cars, and the problem with Mustang, Camaro, and Challenger is the older ones have gotten so crazy expensive that no one can afford them. But nevertheless, there is a really strong market for muscle cars. That's gonna be reflected at the other end in new car sales, I think. So I think these cars have a long life ahead of them. Okay, l let me ask you about a another car that just came out this year, the uh, Type R Civic. Okay, so you have a high, you know the highest performance Civic that we've ever had in the United States. Now, does a young person buy that car or does the person buy a Mustang? I think they'd be cross shopped. Yeah, I think they'll buy either. I think if you're you know a Japanese car guy or gal, you're probably going to go for the uh, Type R, and if you're uh, and here's American, the, yeah, you're going to yeah. go for the Mustang Camaro or Challenger. Here's the funny, I was just driving that car, uh -huh. and I love the car except for the seat, <laughs> which was like you know it's built for like we have a race car driver. Paul used to be the Stig on Top Gear USA, and he's about five, five, very slim build, like a race car driver. And that <laughs> car seat is designed for him. So uh -huh. I was, I was miserable in the car, and then uh -huh. I got in the Mustang, which has Recaros, right? And normally, I'd probably be like, "Oh, these are two. But mm -hmm. They were perfect." I was like, "Wow, man, I'm just cruising." <laughs> these I think it's where your loyalties lie, in a sense, too, where your heritage lies. What you know, people don't go out there with with no idea of what they're going to buy. They they have a feeling towards certain brands. But I want to jump back to something you said about millennials, and it. There are several uh, numbers of research coming to the surface now from places like the Boston Institute and people like that that show actually the original millennial research is wrong. That millennials are buying cars, but they're not buying them the same as people in the generations before. They're waiting until they have kids. They're look, they're different things trigger the car buying process for them. And so I think they are gonna buy cars, but I don't think they're buying them in the same way. For us, it was freedom. Mm -hmm. Like theirs is the cell phone, theirs is the tablet. For us, car was getting out of mom and dad's house, right? Car was being able to go and see your girlfriends, was being able to go and see your friends, was being able to take road trips. They don't need to do that so much anymore because of the community of digital media. Mm -hmm. So they don't have the escapism, so they don't need the cars as early. But you have a kid, and you want to take the bus downtown to go shopping, it's not so much fun anymore. That's where they're buying cars. Okay, but are they going to buy a Mustang or a Challenger or a Camaro, or are they going to buy a crossover? They're going to buy an Escape, or they're going to buy an Equinox or a Journey. I yeah. think, I think you know, I, I have this belief that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. So while, uh, <laughs> so while they may be buying these cars, like Nick said, for different reasons, they're still going to buy whatever they need. And they're still going to aspire to a Mustang Camaro or a Challenger, but they may have to buy a Camry or an Accord or yeah, um, I'm or thinking a more like, like CRV or <laughs> HRV, right? That's kind they of they don't the... buy. Millennials tend not to buy anything that isn't cool or experiential. So they would like the experience of a Mustang, but they're not buying things unless they are value for money. They're loaded with technology, and they make them feel better. Those are the things that they shop for. Unlike the, the things that we used to buy when we were those ages, were more like practicality. You wanted to be cool, but at the same time, you know, you wanted to be able to take your six kids to go play soccer or football or baseball. You had to have the space for it. Mm -hmm. And they're not, they're not so much in that ilk. They're buying things that make them feel like they got a good value, they got a good deal, that they don't have to service a lot, those sort of things. So Is it possible that these cars then become relegated to car sharing type God, applications? No. God, no. Oh, God, no. Yeah, the, 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 the issue I think you have with these cars is they're much more of a personal iconic buy. It's not so much of a buy for practicality. Mm -hmm. And so car sharing tends to be a practical vehicle. Right, I'm just thinking you, you, you buy the vehicle because it's practical, but you like to go out on weekends. I don't know, man. I guess sharing a Mustang would be like sharing your wife or girlfriend. It's just not going to happen. But it's just I do, not going to happen. I have this interesting vision now that when you need to be cool, you could go ride share a Mustang, right? When you have that ultimate need to be like, I need to show off. I 
I don't need to do it all the time, then I go ride share something cool. It's like going to Vegas and getting a Ferrari for the weekend. You know, I live on YouTube and I can tell you that like the guys I work with, you know, who are younger, the first thing that they aspire to, if they don't have crazy amounts of money, then they're getting Lamborghinis and such. You know, they're getting Mustangs, they're getting Subarus, they're getting the, the these iconic cars that have a pedigree of history and have something that speaks to them, whether it's in a different way than it used to speak to us. But I still think it's about, you know, freedom and all the stuff that goes with kind of getting a car and hitting the road. And, well, you it's know, the visceral feel yeah. of the car too, the right? I mean, is, would you guys buy a Mustang? I mean, we're, let's, let's talk about our age group. Would you buy a Mustang? Not as my daily driver. Oh, hell yeah, I would. I wouldn't. See, I, oh, I, just, yeah. I just don't see that. Really? Why not? What's, what's wrong with the Mustang? Is it, it's, it's, I mean, it's an because, experience, I mean, right? Because, you get in the thing right, and you're but like, I mean, but, if, but I'm going to Costco. I mean, you know, it's so? just like, you know, it just is, is not uh, as, so as you uh, stuff the toilet useful. paper in the back, you slam it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard question for me to ask, but I'll let you know when I get to your age group. Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 oh Nick. <laughs> no, but I think, you know, what really cashes the check, if you will, with this new Mustang is just the way it feels, the way it drives. There's very few little niggling things that I, uh, that I can think of that, geez, I wish it was this or I wish it was that. No, when you and I drove this thing yes yesterday, Gary, and I drove it a bit more this morning, this car is just a blast to get in and drive. Would I like to be in rush hour traffic every single day doing it? Hell no, I don't want it for that at all. But if I can get out on some of the roads that we've been in here right. or even back home, yeah, this thing's a blast. Right, to drive. which gets me to the point of, of, you know, that I was saying earlier that this is not necessarily something that, you know, this, this millennial buys because they have this young family, but the guy wants to have that opportunity every now and then. And uh, if, if we have more of this practical purchase, then, you know, Pacifica's value will be going up in, in the market. And, perhaps the value of uh, the Hellcat you know, will go it's, down. It's one of those cars that like, you have a job that is a job, right? And you do it because you have to put m food on the table. When you get in the thing and you drive to work, you feel good and you look forward to getting back in it and driving home. And that's, I think, what sells a Mustang. To me, at least, mm -hmm. and yeah, it's not practical. It's not great in the snow. Yeah, I was gonna say you live in it's Michigan, and that's uh, it's like. A, yeah. But Matt, it makes that drive an experience. Yeah, I'll bet you with traction control and snow tires, there is this a thing there is go a through snow the snow, mode, no right? problem. There's and a, there is a snow there's mode. A snow mode. Right. So yeah. clearly, they thought of that at Ford. I think the other thing about this car is that it has, and and pretty much everything in the class has, but this definitely has. Is I can see buying this car in 2017. And, and walking into my kitchen and pulling the blinds up in 2022 and still feeling good that it's in the driveway because mm -hmm. it has that longevity. It's like, I have a Mustang. And my other half has wanted a Mustang for 20 years. Mine might be in trouble. <laughs> I might have to buy one now. But ultimately, it's the aspirational car. You may not ever yeah. own one, and you're going to feel good when you look at it in five years' time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hey, look, guys, I think we ought to wrap this up right now, but Nick Miles, Roman Micah, thanks so much for coming on the show. Really great getting your insights and talking with you about this. Thank you. Thank you. Really great to be here. So, Gary, another good show under our belt, and we're going to have to do this again next week. How do we do that? Okay, and of course, have to thank all of you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at autoline.tv.